morning again, everyone. You're very, very welcome to Shell Christian Fellowship. Just before my phone doesn't stop sending messages all afternoon, remember Robin Smith and Shelley Gock Roger yeah, in Australia. Have I forgot they mentioned the Australians. So that, like, that's a fate worse than death uh, if I hadn't mentioned them. So welcome to those who are watching in, in Australia as well. Let's just pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you, Lord God, would help us to understand what it is that you're saying to us, Lord, please. You know, we're living in days, Lord, when there is a great apostasy. When people, Lord God, are running away from the truth of your word, where they're compromising it, where they're polluting it and diluting it. Or, Lord, they're cutting away pieces of it because it doesn't suit and it's not politically correct. We ask, Almighty God, that you would make us a people who run to your word, who love your word who have your word permeating through our beings, Lord God, continually setting us free as we walk in this truth. Lord, we ask today that your word would triumph, that Jesus would be exalted and lifted up, and that each of us today would know that we have heard God speak to us, please. Holy Spirit, this subject is all about you, and I'm no authority on you, but you're an authority on yourself, and we just pray that you would make yourself known to us all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we, we're, we're beginning, I'm sure you'll be glad, we're beginning a new phase in our series, What Shadow Believes, which, hard to believe, started in 2000, January 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're starting this new phase from our statement of faith, and there's statements of faith at the back for anyone who, who wants one. Also, for those who are watching on Facebook, if you go on to our website, you will see Shadow's Statement of Faith there. It's what we, uh, as a fellowship, believe. And we're looking at the moment at the work of the Holy Spirit, and now this new phase is namely His ministry in the church today. Now, I have to say that when we go through the Statement of Faith, you've heard me many, many times saying, this is a really controversial subject. This is a really controversial subject. And this is yet another controversial subject because of the many wide, very, and oft-times scary views and opinions that people have on this matter, on the matter of his ministry, the Holy Spirit's ministry in the church today. And so the simple way to begin the topic is to remind ourselves of two very important points which we looked at as we started the work of the Holy Spirit. Firstly, absolutely everything that the Holy Spirit does is to glorify Jesus. Okay, so there's no doubt about that. Absolutely, I hear people say, I have a Spirit-filled, Holy Spirit-led ministry. And then I start to think, mm, a bit of a problem with that. But if it's Holy Spirit-led, that's wonderful. If it's not, then it will not glorify Jesus. Everything that he does is to glorify Jesus. And just as in uh, conversion and sanctification, just as these are the work of the Holy Spirit, so too his ministry in the church today is his ministry. Yeah. Holy Spirit ministries, please listen to this, Holy Spirit ministries do not and never will belong to individuals. I don't care if you've got spray on hair uh, like with some of the godless channel uh, evangelists who run about in white suits and think that they hold the Holy Spirit filled ministry. I don't care what you call yourself. As far as I am concerned, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church is his ministry. It never, ever belongs to an individual. Now we know the Holy Spirit converts, we know he justifies, we know he makes us accepted in the beloved, he sanctifies and he glorifies born again Christians and he dwells in us to renew and restore God's image, <coughs> transforming us into the image and likeness of Jesus. But what is his ministry in the church today? And I bet you if I ask, and I'm not going to open up to and ask people will do it resonate the Bible. So what do you think? the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church today is. We would probably come up with a whole, a whole array of, of wonderful, wonderful answers. So before we look at that question, what is, the, what is his ministry in the church today? Let me ask you this. Have you ever wondered, as a Christian, have you ever wondered, what is God's plan for you? 
Now, do not get this mixed up with what is God's will. God's will is that you should be holy as he is holy. But what is his plan? What is his individual thing for you? What is his service or ministry, his chosen work for you? Or as Paul says, what good works has God prepared for you to walk in? If you are a Christian, the Bible is clear that the Lord has created good works for you to walk in, not someone else, and not your impersonation of someone else. It is for you to walk in. So what is God's plan for you? Or perhaps you're the sort of Christian who thinks, no, I'm a really poor Christian, and the Lord has nothing for me. He's very, very unlikely to use me. Well, let's play on King Solomon's words here for a second. And it's this. There are four evils I've seen under the sun common among Christians. There are four evils I've seen under the sun common among Christians. Firstly, the first evil is Christians who spend much time and effort at the expense of their ministry searching for a ministry where they can serve the Lord. Now, I don't know if you've come across Christians like this, but Christians who spend so much time and effort at the expense of their ministry, searching for a ministry where they can serve the Lord. The second of the four evils under the sun. Christians, much like, I was thinking about this during the week, some of the older ones here will get this, but much like Yasser Hughes, who remembers Yasser Hughes? Sam was very old at the back. Boy. Yasser Hughes from the Boys from the Black Stuff. And there are Christians much like Yasser Hughes from the Boys from the Black Stuff looking at the ministry of others and saying, Give a job, I could do that. Give a job, I could do that. Thinking that they could do it or they could possibly do it better. The third evil under the sun is Christians who exhibit territorial or protective aggression toward others they feel are encroaching on their ministry when in fact all the others are doing are offering to help. And fourthly, Christians who are happy to allow everyone else to do all the ministry while they sit in their backside expecting to be waited on hand and foot. Have you ever come across yeah. any of these Christians? Let's read Genesis chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 15. Genesis 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will heal us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of God, of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're reading verses 1 to 3. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, this is totally nothing to do with the talk, but every time I read this passage, I need to make it clear. We are living in dark, dark days. And in these dark days, when many are falling away from the truth of God's word, they are falling away because they are listening to the lie of the devil which speaks of the spirit of unity. And the spirit of unity has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the church. 
We are not ecumenical. We don't buy into ecumenism in any shape or form. The Bible doesn't teach the spirit of unity. It speaks about endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. There's a subtle difference. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And obviously I want for all of us to be working together to keep the unity in the spirit. The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So, those who know the story of Joseph that I read, they will understand something of what he endured. He was his dad's favorite son. And he was hated by his brothers who planned to murder him. But instead, they sold him into slavery when he was 17 years of age. And you read the story, it's, hor it's horrific. It's people trafficking in those days. They sold their brother into slavery. That's after having thought about killing him. 17 years of age and we're told that he, he cried bitterly that, that they wouldn't do this. And while he was in captivity, he served in the home of a man called Potiphar. And Potiphar was an officer of Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. And then while he was there, Joseph was wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife of attempted rape, and he was put in prison. Having interpreted two dreams of two of the prisoners that were in prison, two years later, Joseph was brought to the attention of Pharaoh because Pharaoh had had a dream, and Pharaoh was told that there's a guy in jail called Joseph, and he knows how to interpret dreams. And so he was brought to Pharaoh, and he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream about seven years of abundance and seven years of famine coming on the land. Well, as a result of doing so, at 30 years of age, Joseph was appointed second in command of Egypt. So here is this guy, at 17 years of age, sold into slavery, wondering what the heck is going on in my life. God, please help me, get me out of this. Please, this can't be helped. How can my brothers do this to me? And then 13 years later, he is the second in command of the whole of Egypt. Well, during the famine years, Joseph's brothers, they came down to Egypt to buy some grain. And Joseph finally, you need to read this in Genesis yourself, but Joseph finally made himself known to them. And he asked them to go and to get his dad and the rest of the family and come down to Egypt to live while the famine continued. Well, when their dad died, the brothers made up this story. They were scared stiff, thinking, he's going to get us now, now that dad's dead. He's going to get us. And so they made up this story that their dad had asked them to ask Joseph to forgive them for what they had done to him years earlier. And listen to what Joseph says. Do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? Now, am I in the place of God? Could be, am I in a place of God where I can judge you and sentence you to death? Am I in that place? Or can we read, do not be afraid. For I am in the place of God. That doesn't mean I'm taking God's place. But that's his answer. Do not be afraid. For I am in the place of God. Tradition says that Paul, the apostle, that he wrote his letter to the Ephesians that we read from while he was in prison in Rome. And having been saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, Paul preached the gospel everywhere that he went and he continually faced opposition, particularly from the religious Jews. Many, many times they wanted to kill him. And when they conspired against Paul and tried to get him to go to Jerusalem for trial where they might kill him, Paul appear, appealed to Caesar and he was taken to Rome. In prison, I mean, we know probably it was more like a house arrest, but nonetheless, in prison, Paul wrote these words. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Now, I spoke a few years ago, some of you will remember, I spoke a few years ago about this, but it came to mind this week as I began to prepare this message on the work of the Holy Spirit and his ministry in the church today. So, if you take Shiloh, for example, Shiloh in this hall has been going for 22 years. 
And over those 22 years, we've seen a lot of wonderful, wonderful things happen in this time. And we've also experienced hardships and heartaches and challenges. But we're still here. Would anyone like to hazard a guess why we're still here? Because God's here. Because God's, God's here. There's two people are saying, because God's here. We're here because the Holy Spirit, who is God, continues his ministry in the church today and continues to minister through the people who worship and serve the Lord in this place. And none of us take a good look around you. I'm about the closest to perfect. But none of us. Being deceived. At least as I'm being deceived. But take a good look around. None of us is perfect. And yet 22 years there, some are coming more recently, but 22 years. The Holy Spirit, taking the imperfections and all, has continued to minister in this church through the people who worship and serve the Lord in this place. And yet, the Lord hasn't, and you can go and check as I checked on my way in case somebody did do it. The Lord hasn't written Ichabod above the doors of Shiloh. Ichabod means the glory has departed. He hasn't written Ichabod over our doors. We're still here because the Holy Spirit graciously continues his ministry in Shiloh to this day. Shiloh isn't a golf club. We're not a social club of people who all have general interests. We are a gathering of like-minded, born-again believers or people who are wanting to know more about what it is to be born again. We're brought together in Jesus, brought together by the Holy Spirit. Let me just explain something. Joseph. Joseph, even though he was sold into slavery at 17 years of age, even though he must have been heartbroken and you know having his family wrenched from his life, and you know, eventually maybe starting to find his feet in the house of Potiphar and, and, and being raised up as the number one servant in the house of Potiphar, then to have Potiphar's wife falsely accuse him of trying to rape him and then shoved into prison. He must have been thinking at the time, what the hell is going on in my life? This can't be right. Where is this God that I worship? And yet, Joseph came to realize that God had brought him on his journey to where he was, not only to preserve his life, but the life of his family, but greater still, the lineage of the promised Messiah. God knew what God was doing. Paul didn't call himself the prisoner of Rome, but the prisoner of the Lord. And that implies that he knew it was where God wanted him to be at that time in his life. I wonder if you were carted off today to Magabre, or you women carted off to Hyde Bank. I wish. But I wonder if you were carted off, how you would feel God's plan. God's plan. Is that, is that what you would think? Soon I'm going to be the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. <laughs> and yet it's incredible because here are these two men who came to realize in their circumstances that God was there and you know that it was through these two passages almost 20 years ago probably just over 20 years ago that the Lord spoke to me through the words of Joseph and Paul God spoke very, very clearly to me as I sat up at the back of the church. And he told me, because I was gurning as I always did, you've made a mistake. I'm not a leader of a church. I'm not a pastor. I don't even want to be a leader of a church. I want to be out on the streets doing evangelism and sketchboards and doing I don't want to be. You've made a mistake. I'm not even educated. I'm a plank. How am I going to tell other people about the things of God? I am not the person. And God spoke and said, I am in the place of God. I am where God wants me to be at this time. And this isn't about me confirming my position in Shiloh. I would love God to bring somebody else in to take over from Shiloh so that I can get away. 
But this isn't about me confirming my role. It's not about me. It's all about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's about being open to the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit minister to us and through us. And that's a case for us all. We all have to be like that. So let me ask you, Christians, as we begin to look at the work of the Holy Spirit and his ministry in the church today, we need to ask ourselves, am I in the place of God? Am I exactly where God wants me to be? And I wonder if I put that question to you as an individual uh, or ask you collectively or those watching on Facebook this morning, if I ask you, are you in the place of God? Are you exactly where God wants you to be? Now you could be sitting in a prison. You may not be in a physical prison, but you could be imprisoned with addiction. But can you see God in that place? Are you in some circumstance in your life and you're questioning what the hell is going on? Where is God? Can you not see God? Can you not find God in that place? Or the question that you need to answer is, am I in the place of God? Am I where God wants me to be at this time? Or are you spending too much time and effort searching for a ministry where you can serve the Lord and you can't see the wood for the trees. You can't see the ministry that he has already given you. It's not your ministry. It is the Holy Spirit and he has already given us all, if you dare say it, ministries, callings. Are you spending too much time because maybe things aren't going the way you think it should be going? You would like to be doing so much more. I'd like to be out in the streets doing that, not doing something worse. I think it was Sam Anderson said to me whenever uh, Keith and uh, David left, I was on my own, he said, why don't you stop Sunday nights? Because the Sunday nights at that time was more gospel oriented. And I said, Sunday nights, I'd rather stop Sunday mornings because we preach the gospel on a Sunday night. Take her out and stone her. (laughs) Here is the point that we have got to ask ourselves, am I in the place of God? Am I where God wants me to be? Am I spending too much time and effort searching for a ministry where we can serve the Lord that we can't see the wood for the trees? We can't actually see the ministry that he has given us or we strayed from it because it's not exciting enough. Is it not your ministry, Christian, to serve the Lord where he has you right now? And then trust him to do the rest. If God needs a specific in your life, he will specifically tell you, God is not a plank. I'm the plank. You might be the plank, but God isn't. God can make his way clear. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his works in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it clear. God, I sound like a brother in Coping Heavens. <laughs> so let me ask you again is it not your ministry to serve the Lord where he has you right now and trust him to do the rest? So if you say, well, I don't know, I want to be doing all these things for God, and God says, you know what? Just be a Christian in your everyday life. Be faithful in simple things, in small things. And see, if you can be faithful in small things, I'll trust you with more things. Or are you looking at the ministry of others? It's like a call. I could do that. (laughs) Guess what you (laughs) hope? I could do that. Or I could do that better. But then, would it be your ministry? Should you not simply be encouraging others in theirs? Do you exhibit territorial or protective aggression towards those who you feel are encroaching on? Oh, this is my ministry. You can't be doing. This is my ministry in the church. You can't be doing that. It's not your ministry. You should be grateful that others are simply offering to help. Or are you happy to sit on your backside, watching everyone else ministering, expecting to be waited on hand and foot, thinking someday, someday, 
God's going to use me. But see, I tell them there's a chance you could get me up a cup of tea. Any chance you could do this? Oh, don't put my name on the cleaning order. Oh, absolutely not. Someone once said to me, I think, uh, don't aspire to be a bishop if you're not prepared to clean the bogs. So let me ask you, Chris, are you in the place of God? Are you where God wants you to be at this time? <coughs> Well, see as you daily offer yourself to God, as you present yourself to him for his glory and service, the Holy Spirit will work in you and through you as he continues <coughs> his ministry in the church today. Remember, you are a born again member of the Lord's church and it's his ministry in the church today. You may possibly, like Joseph and Paul, you may experience doubts, you may have fears, you may have a lot of questions about what's happening in your life right now. But as you have faith in the Lord, he will make things clear. Do you seriously think Joseph thought as he was being carted off to Egypt, well, now God's in control? Of course he didn't. When Paul was being carted off and through the storms and whatever else to Rome, there must have been times when he had questions in his head about words, especially when they were the storm and they looked like they were all going to perish. But then, thankfully, God sent an angel and spoke. We will have doubts. We will have fears. We will question our roles and our positions, dare I say, even our ministries. We will question all of these things about what's happening in my life right now. God's word teaches that we need to have faith in the Lord. Because he will make things clear in his time. Remember, everything that the Holy Spirit does is to glorify Jesus. Whichever, whichever specific ministry he gives you or he calls you to, it must always remain his ministry, not yours. And it must always be for the glory of Jesus. Now let me say it again. If a ministry becomes yours, it is no longer the Holy Spirit's. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? If a ministry becomes yours, it is no longer the Holy Spirit. And of course, Christian, we all have a responsibility to be good stewards of what God has given to us, uh, to guard what the Lord has entrusted to us. But any ministry, any calling, any service, and I don't care how menial you might think it is, any ministry, any calling, any service that you are given to do remains and always will remain the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you make it anything other, it is a work of the flesh and it ceases to glorify Jesus. And you may as well write Ichabod, the glory will depart or the glory has departed. You know that there are churches across this land where probably Ichabod was written above them years ago, and yet people are still going to them. They haven't the clue that the Holy Spirit left a long, long time ago. May that never, ever happen to Shiloh. May everything that you are called to do, Christian, may everything that you are called to do in ministry and service always be motivated by and for the glory of the Lord Jesus. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in you, church, today. And we're going to be looking at some of the wonderful things that he does over these coming weeks. But Christian, let me just say it again. Are you, can you be certain, in the midst of everything that's going on in your life, maybe everything's good at this time in your life, whatever it is, are you in the place of God? Are you where God wants you to be right now. Maybe there's someone here this morning, someone watching you on Facebook, and you're not yet a Christian, but well, everything that the Holy Spirit does is to glorify Jesus. And he wants to glorify Jesus by converting and justifying you, by having you accepted into God's family, sanctifying and glorifying you. And all of this is possible because of Jesus who loves you and who died for you and was raised again from the dead to give you everlasting life. The Holy Spirit 
wants you to receive forgiveness of sins and to have everlasting life. He wants you to be born again. He wants you to become a new creation in Christ. So the question is, do you want this? You would be extremely foolish not to. And so to receive these and many, many more blessings, it requires you to confess your sin, to agree with God that you are a sinner, to repent, to turn around and turn away from your sinful life and sinful ways, and to simply put your trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Will you ask the Holy Spirit today to glorify Jesus in you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning again for your word. When we look at the life of Joseph and what happened to him, when we look at Paul, two men, Lord God, in, in dire circumstances, were brought to a place where they recognized that they were exactly where God wanted them to be. Father, will you please help us to continually ask ourselves, am I in the place of God? Am I where God wants me to be right now? And if we are not, Lord, will you put us in that place? Will you help us to have faith in you? Whatever circumstances we may face, whatever challenges we encounter, may we be able to find you in them and know this is where God is and this is where I need to be. And may you help us, Lord, please, to glorify you. Lord, I know that there are these evils under the sun where Christians get caught up looking at ministries, wanting better ministries. Others, Lord God, uh, maybe only wanting to help but are scared to do so, Father. Lord, help us all to realize that we are a body working together for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we build one another up and not tear one another down. May we support one another and may we find, Lord God, uh, the ministries, the callings, the services that you want us to do, Lord God, and that we will bring you glory in doing that, please. Lord, may we all be able to say today, you know what, I am, I am in the place of God. I am what God wants me to be right now. Lord, I ask for any unbeliever. I ask that they would see that they're not in the place where God wants them to be. God wants them to be saved. They want, he wants them to be in Christ. May the Spirit of the living God draw them onto Jesus. And may he receive them, please. May they do, Lord God, what your word says. Confess their sin. May they repent of their sin. And may they put their trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone so they too can say in whatever situation they face, I am now in the place of God. I am where God wants me to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.